hey, did I get your attention? Isn't this an amazing car, beautiful car? What a car. Anybody know what it is? You got a guess? Can you say it out loud so you go on record with somebody you're with? Besides uh, Tom and Angie Kaczynski, it's their car. Got a guess? It's a 1937 two-door humpback Ford sedan. Did you get it right? And no, it's not an optical illusion. It really is here. I'm just not allowed to touch it. Tom Kaczynski is a retired Lakeshore High School teacher, a a master welder, and going, no kidding. And uh, Tom and Angie, they're members here at the chapel. Tom and Angie used to be in our small group that meet in our home for a number of years. And uh, this is his car. And what I wouldn't give to have this car. You know, I think there's one of the commands by Moses that said, do not covet thy neighbor's car. (laughs) No, that's not quite right, but it's still in there, isn't it? But I'm not sure I would want the way it used to be. Because this is how it used to look. This is when Tom got it. He had to dissemble, take this whole car apart, down to the frame, and then he had to rework the frame itself from top to bottom. Restoration. You know, it involved every piece of this car. And with his skills and wisdom and abilities, part by part, it was being restored. No, no, it was being transformed into something far better with a huge, are you ready for this, V8 Chevy engine. Look at that beautiful interior, power windows, power steering, tilting wheel. You kidding me? Not in 1937. Extra leg room in the back. Beautiful, comfortable, modern conveniences. This car wasn't just restored. We could say it's been made new. And Tom literally put this car together. There are some new parts. A lot was handcrafted parts by Tom himself created for this car, moving the battery from under the hood to the trunk. Some pieces purchased, but all built together by Tom to make it better than it ever was. And that's a great picture of what God does to us when he calls us to himself. And we trust him as our savior, our rescuer, to make us new. Let this beautiful, restored car be a reminder that through our time together this morning of what our Lord has done to us. It's 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Thanks, Tom, for sharing that part of your life with us. You know, we could ask the question, why would you undertake such a project as this? Uh, Isn't it because the object is worth it to us? So what's it take to restore things? Oh, it takes time and effort and plenty of patience, wisdom, skill, hard work. Well, let's move from objects to people. It takes a lot of the same time and effort and plenty of patience and wisdom But we could add, it might add things like it also takes communication skills and compassion. There's one more ingredient to have restoration with people, and that key is repentance, having a right heart. To restore anything that's valuable to us, like this car. You know, it has to be worth it to us because it takes a lot of work to be restored, to be made new. It's not worth it unless it's worth it to us as believers. You know, the result of repentance can lead to restoration. And that's a beautiful thing. But is it worth the effort? Our study of the fifth major judge of Israel, Jephthah, we see that in the book of Judges. So please take your Bibles and turn again to Judges chapter 10. In the 10th chapter... In the 10th chapter, the tribes of Israel are on the east side of the Jordan, and they were being subdued by the Ammonites. And they were putting the squeeze on Israel, and the Ammonites oppressed Israel for 18 years. 
As we saw last week, the Lord's disciplining hand was being carried out with purpose on Israel. And they call, they call out to the Lord and they repent of their sin and their disobedience, their idolatry, and they make restoration with the Lord. And we see that in our study this morning. Restoration, we see it in the beauty of this car. Well, now Israel is ready to do battle with the Ammonites, except they had no leader. I agree with those scholars who believe that this is a picture of repentance and it was genuine in Israel. Okay, looking at the text. We're going to see three reasons why we need to not just be repentant of our sin, but why we need to live a life that is repentant, of repentance. Let's remember, repentance is a change of direction. It's going in one direction and it's turning around and going into another direction. In the three chapters that we see here, children of God... Uh, for us, right, we trust Jesus as our Savior. We have to live in a repentant way of life as well. So why have a repentant heart? As we saw last Sunday, first is to be right with our Heavenly Father. But in, in life, you know, we don't live in isolation. It's not just me and God living. We live in life in community with many, many other people. So point two, to be right, we have to be right with others, Right? And for that to happen, uh, we realize, point A, that life might not be fair. Often it isn't. The way we choose to live life is going to impact our relationships for sure. And that's what we see in verses 1 to 3. These verses are really a parenthesis of this text, giving us some background on Jephthah. Even though life can be unfair, we need to make our attempt to be right with others because we're living repentantly. And we gotta to choose to live this way even though, point one, we may face prejudice. You know, some face it more than others. But we have to choose to live rightly in relationship with others, even if others are being prejudiced against us. People can look at our circumstances and be prejudiced in such a way because of skin color or background or education or nationality or beliefs or because you're poor or because you're rich or because you are a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Jephthah is a son of a man named Gilead. And that name was famous because the first Gilead was the grandson to the father of the tribe of Manasseh. And no doubt this is an upper class family. But Jephthah's father was sinful. He was with a prostitute, and she becomes pregnant. And Jephthah is born an illegitimate child. It's possible that this prostitute was not an Israeli. Conception through the sin of adultery, through the sin of prostitution, having sex outside of the bond of marriage. None of that is the sin of the child, is it? We know, we know that. It's not the child. The child's not guilty. But we see resentment against Jephthah because of it, because of his father's sin. And so as long as dad was around, everything was hunky-dory there at home. But when dad was gone, those brothers were against him. They would not share their inheritance with this kind of a brother, and they drove him away. Oh, the sin of prejudice. Indeed, Jephthah was sinned against. For sure, life isn't always fair, we know that. In the injustice of life, point two, we may be mistreated. Jephthah certainly was. He was cut out from his rightful inheritance. He was driven out of his home. Uh, Jephthah, feeling this endangerment, was off. He fled. Point three, a little application. Life is often not fair. So what are we going to do about it? Are we going to commit the same sin against them because they did it to us? Do we treat them that way? Well, I'm going to let them feel the pain that they've caused me. They've ripped my heart out. I'm going to rip their heart out too. We live like that sometimes. That's doing what's right in one's own eyes, not in the eyes of God. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, but I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In your outline, I put a number of other scriptures that talk about this issue. There's a key thought from Paul in Romans 12. He wrote, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And that's all we can do. That's our part. 
But that doesn't mean don't seek justice. God established government for those purposes, the courts, to push through justice. But that's not on you and me. We're not to be doing the getting back. We're not to do the getting even. As far as possible, as it depends on us, we need to try to make our, uh, be right with others. Life is not always fair, and yet we're to seek to be fair with others. So how do we live repentantly? Point B, we learn to deal with life's difficulties. Let's, let's always be learning from what has happened to us in life. Jephthah takes right steps. Let's make some principles from Jephthah. First one, develop your abilities, even in times of mistreatment. And why? Because God will still be at work in us. And there are invaluable lessons that we can learn through those hard times. Jephthah is in a remote area called Tob, some 40 miles from his home area. And there he gathers around him mercenaries, a gang of scoundrels. It's the same word used to describe the wicked men that Abimelech gathered around himself in chapter 9. Our text says they followed him. Why? Not because he had money. It wasn't because he was famous. God's hand, was it upon him? Is that why? Because of his leadership skills? Or did he have a chip on his shoulder? It seems that while in this region with these unemployed men, he develops them in a force to be reckoned with. This would have been similar to David when he fled from Saul and took a band of men in 1 Samuel chapter 22. It's very possible that Jephthah had a heart for the Lord and that he's faithful to God, depending upon the Lord. Sometimes hardships come to us and, 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 and things happen to us. And it's, we've got to make the most out of this for the glory of God. Maybe it's possible that he's protecting some of the towns in that region from the Ammonites. Indeed, he had developed a reputation. First one, he's called a mighty warrior. S similar word, it could mean upper class or it could mean truly a person of might. Right? It's based on duty, what he's doing. When we face mistreatments in life, we have a choice. We can get angry over it, right? We, 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 we could by turn that destruction over to others. Some of us, others, when, when we're mistreated, we just kind of glide through life and want to just escape our way through it. Others of us are going to make the most of those opportunities, even in the face of prejudice and mistreatment. In dealing with the difficulties in life, another valuable lesson to learn when we are right with the Lord, point two, is that we've got to forgive others. That is not easy, but it surely does reflect a repentant heart. Look back at the end of chapter 10. Israel had repented of its sin and took right action. So these people are ready to obey. They're ready to fight the Ammonites. The problem is they don't have a leader. Well, the elders know about this one back in Tob. They're desperate enough to seek the help of an illegitimate son of Gilead? Are you kidding me? Were they just desperate? Or did they have forgiveness in their hearts? Were they sorry for how they mistreated him? Did their hearts change? It's possible. I have that positive view. They leave Gilead. And they head to Tob to talk with Jephthah, verse 6. And they say, come, be our commander so that we can fight against the Ammonites. And Jephthah must have built a reputation for leadership, for being a commander, a mighty warrior. But Jephthah isn't flattered. He's not gullible. He handles himself well. Verse 7, look at it. There's no vindictiveness in Jephthah. I think that's a mark of repentant heart. He does ask some tough questions. He reminds them of what they did to him. Look at verse 7. Didn't, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now, now that you're in trouble? The way he questioned the leaders seems to imply that they were some of the guilty ones of his expulsion. And maybe some of his brothers are now leaders in that tribe. This is just a brief account. 
Verse 8. Certainly the elders swallow their pride. They say, nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites. And you will be head over all who live in Gilead. They'll make Jephthah their ruler. Even when the battle's over. We can't help but see the spiritual mindedness of both the leadership and that of Jephthah. That's repentance. Verse 9, Jephthah still doesn't know if he can trust these men. That's understandable. He says, suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head, or are you going to chase me out again? I believe the elders of Gilead went seeking forgiveness, and they find Jephthah was forgiving. Again, I agree with those who take this positive view. Verse 10 and 11, they go to Mizpah and they make their vow before the Lord. That was the right thing for them to do. Some application. We all know life can be hard and harsh. It can be unfair. Some of you going through this pandemic, you know, because Michigan's tighter than what Nebraska may be, maybe you've lost a lot. And it wasn't your doing. When life is unfair, we all have choices to make as believers. Will I choose to live by faith in this? Will I trust the Lord no matter the battle I'm in? That's being right according to the Lord and his word. For that to happen, first we have to seek that rightness with God, and then we seek rightness with others. And that is the result of a repentant life. The elders could have easily, out of pride and sin, refused to go to that one. Well, they do go to Jephthah. And they seek to be right with him. How easy it would have been for Jephthah to have refused to talk to them, to not hear them out. Why would I trust them? But he seeks to be made right with him, them. Let's live repentantly. Let's be determined not to allow the the ugliness of life itself to keep us from all that God could be teaching us and instructing us and wanting us to accomplish in the midst of the ugliness for his glory. Is there someone that you need to go to to make right? But the third reason in our text why we would live repentantly, why we would seek restoration to God and with others, point three, it's to have victory in life. Victory is ours when we're right with the Lord and when we're right with others, no matter what's happening. God will honor that. God will bless that. So what are the steps to victory? We see several in our text. Point A, we have to seek peace through communication. Jephthah does that before going to war. Hey, I've got a novel idea. In your marriage, how about working on communication? before you go to war, huh? Great book on communication, Key to Your Marriage. I love that book. And in it, there's gonna be some reading and then there's some some questions for you to work through as, as a husband and wife, as a couple. Communication is key to our marriage. It's key to being right with each other. It's key to being right with God. Jephthah does communicate. Look at verse 12. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with the question, what do you have against me that uh, you have attacked my country? If Jephthah was full of pride, pride in his own accomplishment, maybe with his band of fighters, maybe to think that the elders came to me and offered me to be head of, the, of, their, of their tribe, and what would have been the next event if he was full of pride? It wouldn't have been communication. It would have been war. But that's not his first step. His first step. I am impressed with this. This is good stuff. This is right. There is a lesson here. Let's try peace and negotiations before war. So what do we communicate? Point one, we communicate background. Jephthah does that. Look at verse 13. Jephthah gets his reply from the king of Ammon. While Israel came up out of Egypt and took away my land from the Arnok to the Jabbok, all the way to the Jordan... Now give it back peacefully. So Jephthah capitulates, right? That's the way of peace, isn't it? No. He communicates back to the king the background of the situation. The king doesn't understand that this land never did belong to him. 
Jephthah lays out the history in the taking of the land. It's important to see that Jephthah had a great understanding of God's word and Israel's history. Israel was going, when going to the promised land, was not allowed to take Edom nor Moab since they were relatives through Lot and Esau. And that's Deuteronomy chapter 2. That's mentioned in your outline. Israel asked if they could pass through their nations en route to the promised land, but both kings said no. So Israel honored that and took the long detour around their borders. And then they came to the Amorites. Okay, let's hear the difference between Amorites and Ammonites. There's two different countries. And, and, and he asked those of the Amorites if they could go through their country on the main roads and not go through the fields and vineyards. But the king, Sion, refused. And so they, he, mustered up his army to march out to the desert against Israel. And they fought Israel, but Israel got the victory. Israel won the land, not from Ammon, but from the Amorites. And Israel settled in that land. In fact, God told Israel not to go into the land of Ammon. Numbers 21. Israel, however, put Sion to the sword and took over his land from the Arnak to the Jabbok but only as far as the Ammonites because their borders were fortified. Thus, this disputed land was rightfully Israel's, obtained not from Ammon, but from the Amorites through war. Okay, what do we learn? Jephthah is seeking peace. And first, he communicates background information. There's another principle. Clarify the issues. That's point two. Maybe, maybe there's misunderstanding. So Jephthah clarif seeks to clarify the issues. We see several more lessons that we can learn from Jephthah. This is great in communication. Point eight, state your thoughts clearly. Look at verse 23. Jephthah is really clear, expressing what he thinks, right? He says, you don't have a right to claim this land. It wasn't your land in the first place. B, use logic when you can. Look at verse 24. Jephthah speaks of the god Chemish. Chemosh was the specific god of the Moabites, while the god of the Ammonites was Malcham. It's possible that Jephthah was confused here. But more likely, Ammon was the dominant nation over Moab. And with that, they added in Moab's god. And Jephthah would have known that. It's interesting that after the mention of this god, Chemosh, he writes of the Moabites. Look at verse 25. In referring to their God, Jephthah is not supporting that he believes in their God. He's just making the case that they believed in their God, and they believe God gave them that territory, and it's theirs. And then he says, well, the territory our God gives us is ours. Here's another principle, point C. Use comparisons to clarify. Verse 25. He's saying, Are you, do you think you're better than the king of, of Moab? Right? Balak. Did he ever quarrel with Israel and fight with them? The king of Moab was terrified as Israel was moving into the promised land. That passage of scriptures, Numbers 22, is in your outline. Look at it. In that account, we have King Balak seeking the prophet Balaam. You remember this story. Balaam's a prophet. He speaks for God. And, and Balaam was asked by this king to come and curse Israel. And you remember, he gets on his donkey and his donkey, and he keeps crushing him against the wall or wherever, and he's mad at his donkey. And then what? The donkey speaks, and there's the angel of the Lord with his sword. And, and, and Balaam had to learn I can only speak for God. I can't curse God. And so when he gets to the king, he says, I can't curse Israel. Israel has legitimate claim to this land. The king Balak makes no attempt to take the land back. So why wouldn't this king, Ammon? Are you greater than the king of Moab? That's his point. He's making a comparison. Principle D. Use a timeline. That's a new invention, isn't it? Use a timeline. He says, Israel's had this land for 300 years. If it belongs to you, why are you waiting for now to take it? Principle E, call for resolve. Verse 27. Jephthah couldn't be any clearer. I haven't wronged you, but vice versa, you've wronged me. Bottom line, I'll put my trust in Yahweh, the absolute ruler and judge. He's Lord of the universe. He can make the decision between us. 
and certainly lets the king of Ammon know exactly where Jephthah stood. To have victory in life, we need to do all we can to have peace through communication. That is an important principle for life. But there are times when we have to do more than just communicate. There are times when we must, point B, take our stand for the Lord. You know that. I know that. Verse 28. We see very clearly that the king of Ammon wanted peace, but he wanted it his way. Give me the land back or else. And he rejects what Jephthah communicated. Yeah, who is this Yahweh anyway? Some renegade? There are times when you and I have to take our stand for Christ and bear the consequence because it's the right thing to do. And we're going to carry out what God wants us. And it was clearly, not from our own thoughts, but from his word. And we're going to take the results, right? And we're going to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Here we see the Spirit of the Lord coming upon Jephthah. And he is ready to take a stand for the Lord. And in the power of the Lord, he's going to go through the territory. He's going to gather and summons his troops for battle. And then he makes a vow. We're going to look at that passage on June 7th. We have very little detail about the battle. Verse 33, verse 34, or verse 32 and verse 33. But in the Lord gave the victory to Israel, devastating 20 towns, subduing Ammon. That victory in life as children of God, family of God. Point C, we gotta deal with threats to unity. There's no true victory with the infection of disunity. You got that, right? You agree with it? When it's a cancer, Disunity impacts, it implodes families, it impacts churches, it can impact businesses and companies. Our own nation, here, right? It'd be great if there was unity, but we don't see unity. The only way there's going to be great unity is when a mass of people come to know Jesus as their Savior. Because the divide that's happening isn't because who's president, it's about moral truth. And the divide is just going to get worse. I put in your outline a number of passages that the past apostle Paul used about unity. Look at them. When we see disunity, we need God's wisdom to know how to handle it and how to resolve it. Within the family of God, you know, we need to work on restoration, just like this beautiful car. We need to be able to, to see how it can take something that's ugly and make it new. The restoration is often through repentance, changing the mind, changing the attitude. You see, I used to be going in a way against you, but I've repented in my heart, and now I can join you. That's what this is about. What we have here is very similar to what Gilead did, uh, or rather Gideon had to do in chapter 8 with the same group, the Ephraimites, when he went out and defeated the Midian, um, people of Midian. And, and the Ephraimites were upset because they weren't involved. And with a soft answer, Gideon calms them down. Well, there was no calming here. Ephraimites, that was a leading tribe in central and northern Israel. These people couldn't see the victory. They only saw their non-involvement in the victory. And they were filled with arrogance. Look at chapter, chapter 12, verse 1. I'm going to read that. The Ephraimite forces were called out. And they crossed uh, over to Zephon, and they said to Jephthah, why did you go to fight the Ammonites without calling us to go with you? We're going to burn your house over your head. Jephthah answers. He says, I and my people were engaged in a great struggle with the Ammonites, and although I called, you didn't save me out of their hands. When I saw that you wouldn't help, I took the life, my life in my, own, in my hands and crossed over to fight the Ammonites. And the Lord gave me the victory over them. Now, why have you come up today to fight me? It's very likely that, that Gilead, you know, in its 18 years of battle with the Ammonites, uh, would have sought help of their sister tribes, neighboring tribes, but none helped. In this battle with Ammon, there is no mention in the text uh, of, of anyone from the west side of the Jordan coming into the battle. Though Jephthah indicates a general calling out for, for help. It's also possible, it's not mentioned here, because no one came to help, otherwise it would have been mentioned. Jephthah makes this point, I put my life on the line for you. So often, issues of disunity are over jealousy. 
you know? It's about me and my thoughts and my opinions. And it's my involvement, and I'm upset because you didn't invite me, and, and I'm upset because, because you didn't, you didn't, you went ahead without me. And you know, we see that in the church way too often. Fights and quarrels. My idea wasn't used. I wasn't even asked to help. They made the decision without me. The point is, ultimately, the battle isn't about us. It's about the Lord. Ministry isn't about you. The advancement of the kingdom, it's about God's people. It doesn't have to be me. If the job gets done without me, what should we all say? Praise God. Praise God. Ephraim shouldn't be complaining about a victory that was accomplished by God's intervention, his miraculous intervention, all for the benefit of his people. Jephthah's army, having been dismissed, now has to come back for another battle, verse 4. And it's a sad day for Israel because it's brother against brother. It's families that, that, that are going to fight family in that sense. That happens in the church. It happens in families, and that's not good. They weren't to be the enemy. They shouldn't have been, they should have been united in obedience to the Lord. But the Ephraimites could not accept that leadership. Look at verse 4. This is all arrogance. They, you know, the Ephraimites aren't going to escape this time. There's a battle, and no one's going to escape. Look at verse 5. By this time, the people, having lived in their own tribal uh, territories, it's been long enough for their... The development, let's say, of accents. You know, someone who lives in Philadelphia, I thought, I could I pull out the Philadelphia accent? No. It's different than us Michiganders, which is different than those who live in the South, and I'm not going to say that either. But those who lived in the tribe of Ephraim, by this time, they lost the ability to pronounce S-H words. So the test that they were going to use here, if you're going to live or to die... Was, was, would be at the fords where all the Ephraimites had to cross over to escape. And they were asked to say the word shibboleth. It means ear of grain or flowing stream. It really doesn't matter what it means. Because, you see, they couldn't get the H in there. And if they would have said sibboleth, they were killed. And 42,000 Ephraimites were killed. It all goes back to their disunity and their arrogance. They saw themselves as a leading tribe of Israel. They weren't leading. This renegade was leading. You don't know who you're missing, messing with, mister. You, you, you think you can tell us what to do? When to come and when not to come? And rather than back down, they went to war. And what happened to Ephraim and their military, it, it, it virtually wiped them out. And as a result, this tribe never regained any preeminence in Israel. Application. What does it take for someone to have victory? God's kind of victory? It takes repentance on our part. When our hearts are repentant, when we're right with the Lord, then what? We'll seek out Christ first. And we'll do that through communication. Husbands and wives in our families, let's communicate. We don't have to fight. Let's talk it through. Work it out. Sit down and talk. We need to do the same in the body of Christ. We need to talk it out, clarify, do that through communication. You know, we're, gonna, we're working through this regathering. When are we going to regather in this building? We've got to talk that out. Is there any one right way? No. We've got to reason it out, think it through. We've got to communicate, got to ask questions. We need to all develop our communication skills. So you know what one important communication skill is? It's the gift of Listening. If we don't listen well, and I'm still working on that at home. Lisa's sitting right, right there. She knows. I'm still working on listening. But if we're not listening to what the other person says, we're daydreaming or we're thinking of our defense system or, or we're thinking of another solution, we need to just stop and listen to that person. That is one of the first steps key to communication. For sure, more and more of us in our sinful society we're going to have to take our stand for Christ because it's going to get worse, not better. How do we experience victory? We have to live in obedience to God and his word, not society. And instead of disunity, we better seek resolve as much as we can, when we can, at home and at work and in the church. 
as we close, why live a repentant heart, a repentant life? Why should we be willing to change, to become more like Jesus? Because it produces gr the greatest results. You look at this beautifully restored car. You know, we can't be restored like that car is until we have a heart that's right with God, which means it takes the old parts, the rusted parts, the, the, the parts that are broken and are exchanged and made new. God can make us new. Restore us through repentance. Are we willing to repent? Here's what I ask of us. Three scriptures. The first is Matthew chapter 6. It says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's how we need to live. Secondly, let's be kind and compassionate, forgiving. Third, let's, if possible, as far as it depends on us, we can't change the other person, but as far as it depends on us, we need to live at peace with everyone. Are we willing? Let's bow for prayer. Heads bowed. Each of us needs to be able to answer the question. Am I right with the Lord? That, right relation, that starts with the right relationship with the Lord through Jesus Christ. We all sin. We're separated from God because of our sin. We're facing the consequences, which is eternal death, eternity in hell. Every one of us. But God, Jesus Christ came to this earth as God in flesh to pay the price for that sin, that through his death our sins are forgiven and washed away. But for us to experience that cleansing, we have to come to Christ in faith with a repentant heart to be restored into a right relationship. You need that right now. If you're listening, you, you've not responded to Christ's call to your heart, why not right now? Silently, you can pray. You can say, Jesus, I understand. You died on that cross. Pay the price for our sin so that we can be brought into your family. And right now, I turn from it. I confess it. And I ask you to make me new. Cleanse me. I give my life to you. If you've prayed that prayer with me, would you email any of us pastors? Call us. We want to talk with you. Help you in a next step of what to do as a believer. For those of us who are watching, and, and maybe there's something in our life, there's a sin, specific sin in our life that we still have not repented of, maybe you need to drop to your knees right now and pray to the Lord, talk to the Lord, confess that sin to him. Turn from it. Confess it anew. If there's someone that you are at odds with, God's word calls us to make things right as far as it we can we can't change that other person. Is there a person or two that you need to go to and seek to make things right? As a believer, will you do it? Our Heavenly Father, you hear our prayers that we'd be people who turn from sin quickly to make things right with you, to make things right with one another, to be restored to be made new. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray that. Lord, I thank you that you are the one that we can go to, that your grace is there, your cleansing of, of our sin. We can call out to you. May we live that way every day, I pray in your name. Amen. Let's sing.